This edition of Tech Talk is brought to you in part by Telex, the interconnection company, owners and operators of 56 Marietta, the most network-rich co-location facility in the southeast. Tag TV and Tag Radio. Technology now has a voice of innovation and information. Get it on www.tagtvonline.com. Startup companies come in all forms, but the phrase is usually associated with high-growth, technology-oriented companies, you know, the kind that typically are more scalable than a fully established business in the sense that they can potentially grow rapidly with limited investment of capital, labor, or equipment. Enter Rad Harrell, president and founder of a rapidly growing startup company called Talent Soup, what some people are already calling a potentially disruptive technology for the advertising industry. Rad began developing Talent Soup within his six-and-a-half-year-old media production company, Stir, as a web marketplace and, and marketing engine to help ad agencies, photographers, and producers find the exact faces they, they were looking for and, and spun out the new startup uh, earlier this year. Greetings, everyone. It's Tuesday, June 9th, 2009, and this is Tech Talk with Technology Association of Georgia President Tino Mantella. I'm your guest host, Frank Baia. When it comes to starting a business, the question of where can be just as crucial as what, why, or even how. Some cities offer better business climates for entrepreneurs than others, and in today's economy, entrepreneurs need all the help they can get when launching a new business. On this edition of Tech Talk, we take a look from the entrepreneur's perspective of launching a startup right here in Atlanta as we speak with Talent Soup's founder and president, Ray, Rayford Harrell. Rad's first external funded startup was in 2000 called ThoughtBank, a marketplace for surgeons' product ideas. The company raised a moderate angel round, but in 2003 it disappeared, as many dot-com startups did, due to a lack of cash. Rad joined Stir Productions, where he co-founded with, with his wife, Emily, full-time in 2006, where he developed the Talent Soup software and business model. The decision to spin out Talent Soup right here in Atlanta as an independent operating entity was made in January 2009. Atlanta, business launch pad powerhouse or a problem for potential startups? As we tech talk with entrepreneur and founder of the startup Talent Soup, Rad Harrell. Rad, welcome to Tech Talk. Thank you for having me, Frank. Well, I have to say, unrelenting persistence. You know, I guess it's, uh, I often draw the analogy of uh, close encounters. You know, when you have a concept or an idea, you just kind of keep hearing that tune in your head and start playing around with mashed potatoes. <laughs> is, is that kind of what happened with you? Give us a little insight about uh, what was the motivation behind Talent Suit. You know, I think the some of the best uh, product ideas and business ideas really are founded out of a need of your own, a personal need, and Talent Soup's no different. We were uh, running a media production company called Stir, which my wife, Emily, continues to run, and she was managing a, a large number, over the course of a couple of years, a large number of in-person castings, which uh, if your audience has ever watched American Idol and they do some flyovers of these enormous lines of people standing uh, standing outside waiting to get in and have their shot at fame and fortune, uh, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a very large open casting. But uh, over the course of a few years, uh, developed some pretty great processes for managing all of those people that would come to these castings. But we quickly, quickly realized that technology offered uh, an ease of use and, and some management uh, capabilities that we just didn't have in our analog system. So that's how the software and the general concept was born uh, as an internal project. And it really picked up steam, uh, I guess, about six, six or eight months after launch, uh, back in late 2006, um, when some, some of our local clients here in the southeast knew that we had, uh, we had access to some real people and actors that uh, might, might fit an unusual advertisement that they needed a face for, not your typical model. And, uh, and that's when it really just kind of took off. Now, this isn't, uh, you know, your first rodeo, as they say. Um, I mentioned earlier about Thought Bank, and mm -hmm. as I understand it, that actually came out of some experience that you were having then as far as being in the design and marketing of cardiovascular devices. And Card cardiovascular, yeah. I actually came out of the medical device space uh, 
and a lot of my day was spent talking with surgeons about uh, product information, product feedback, um, usability, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And over the course of several years in, in, in the role of a, of a developer of devices, uh, it, you know, a lot of the same questions were being asked, um, how to protect, how to create intellectual property, how to protect intellectual property, what does licensing look like, you know, how, how do I address a very large medical device company with some ideas that I have that the surgeons rightly deemed valuable. And uh, so we created a, a pretty large chunk of software to, to knock the edges off of that very complex problem. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's actually, there's some, there's some interesting parallels. Certainly, well, I think Stand- one, one obvious parallel is the fact that, in, and I guess more or less what we're saying to anyone that's listening that's interested in starting or launching a business, sure. is that you're actually coming with some background and experiencing. You're not just simply, you know, an aha factor, an epiphany where you just got a great idea. You've been living in that environment and more or less are solving a problem. Absolutely. I, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, you you would be your best customer. So I think with with any entrepreneur, if they would be willing to, part with some hard-earned cash uh, for their product or service, it's, it's likely that there are others that would be as well. Uh, and then it, then it becomes just applying the, the knowledge and, uh, and the skill set you have um, and then mm-hmm. supplementing it with, with some smart folks. And, uh, you know, well, are you a programmer or do you consider yourself you an know, architect? I, or a... uh, no, I consider myself a, a marketer and uh, – I'm probably smart enough to be dangerous and expensive, but not smart enough to. I'm quite envi- envious uh, of software engineers. So in both the, these cases, the you've been you're, you've been more of a conceptualizer than you. I'm absolutely the generalist. You bet. Yeah. I'm the I'm the guy that can can motivate and evangelize it, um, mm-hmm. and and really construct it. I, I process is my thing, so I'm I'm pretty adept at putting those disparate pieces together into some kind of flow. Um, but actually, the nuts and bolts of it, yeah, I've always, always contracted that out. Let's talk a little bit about uh, in being an evangelist and taking something from, you know, Eastern philosophers have this a line I use a lot, and that is that the moment of non-existence before existence, and mm. that time when, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a, I get frustrated sometimes because I see innovation so many times happening in what I call a silo and. And really, there's not very much collaboration. You're very much isolated. A lot of redundancy and duplication just mm-hmm. out of necessity. You have to create mm-hmm. so many of your own, recreating the wheel kind of a thing. But sure. tell us about that that moment. You know, when you were sitting with your with Emily, or maybe even by yourself, but you're you're saying, you know, I can do better than this, and we can come up with a concept. Maybe go into a little bit about what happened next. Sure. Well, I, I think what what you're describing is in any in any complex system. Um, given the the interconnectivity of our world, there's latent value, um, and to your point, and not necessarily vertically. That you know, it, it is about trying to have a fresh perspective on uh, on the machine that you have in front of you to to generalize, uh, you know, a chunk of software, a chunk of code, or a or a web enabled system, a web enabled app uh, like ours is. Where you're, you're looking for sort of lateral places to put it, you know, where else could this be applied, et cetera. And for us, it was, again, it was really necessity. It was the, the what I would call the pain associated with some some analog, you know, labor-intensive processes of managing lots of faces and lots of demographic and psychographic information, and uh, and just looking looking at you know knowing what the capabilities or at least some of the capabilities of technology are, and finding a way to lay that on top of our problem in a way that, you know, the output was a reduction of labor, ease of use, et cetera. So, you know, for, for us, it's, uh, it's really about taking a fresh perspective and, uh, and looking for new ways to do things. Now, fresh perspective can really create a lot of excitement, uh, and also it can create a lot of confusion where people are looking at it and saying, okay, how do you make money doing this? Sure. Um, is this a situation where you self-funded this uh, after coming out of the thought bank um, and having to uh, deal with moving on to the next thing and, and not seeing that happen the way you thought it was going to? You know, are you coming at it with 
a lesson learned, so you're coming at it with a greater experience, or are you maybe just a little bit gun shy based on the fact that you did it before and it didn't quite pan out? You know, I, I don't. Uh, I test very high for risk. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and that sounds odd, but um, but I do. So it's it really isn't about being gun shy. I think it is. To your point, it's about learning learning all you can from your past mistakes, but not being hindered by them. And uh, if if I'm gun shy about anything, it would be uh, my fiduciary responsibility to the company and making the company successful. Mm. And and so from that, you know, we're uh, we kind of got caught up with Thought Bank. We got caught up in the uh, the moment, you know, the late '90s and and uh, and two thousand sure. with the you know middle of the bubble, I suppose, and. Um, it was still a you know it was still challenging to go out to the angels and the friends and family and and raise that big chunk of cash um, so I think the lesson learned for us today is uh, to answer your question yes thought bank uh, I'm sorry uh, talent soup was was uh, cash flowed and uh, now we're operating out of a line of credit from the bank an operating line um, to build the next generation of software and mix that with cash flow um, but I think we're just we're more diligent and careful about the real value and the timing of that value that outside investment brings because it's I think it's way more than just the dollars and um, I you know from my perspective sitting sitting kind of on the inside of the creation and trying to put the pieces together when I meet other entrepreneurs that uh, that have written a really powerful business plan and there may be some legitimate potential value there but you know to run right out immediately and start looking for money um, for us is not the not the best return on that on that time and energy investment and so for now we're focused on really driving revenues and building the company um, so that when we when we do reach out if that if that day comes here in short order when we do reach out to some you know some external funding sources that we're we're eyes wide open that we we know what our value proposition is to a potential investor, and I think that makes us better able to uh, to manage the relationship and really extract the maximum amount of outcome from that type of you know that type of external involvement. Well, I think we uh, anytime anybody was involved in that dot com period, the, the years that you're talking about, the nine, late 90s and early 2000, I think the term unbridled exuberance probably carries a lot of weight in that case. Sure. But, but now it's a case where a uh, lot tougher. Uh, a lot of the VCs are talking about uh, being uh, uh, concerned about risk and, and looking for um, uh, stronger evaluations and quicker turnaround to get their money back. Um, have you played around in that field much at all in terms of you know the original discussion that we were talking about for today? Atlanta, as far as being, a, in your opinion, is it a good place or a bad place in terms of uh, acceptance of risk or getting involved in a startup situation? Well, for for Thought Bank to, if we're going to learn from our history, um, you know, Atlanta, we, the the co-founder and I of Thought Bank, uh, uh, a smart business guy named Jim Mitchell, um, he and I, we had reduced the cities down to two, and it was sort of Tyson's Corner, the D.C., you know, Virginia area, and Atlanta, and we had a lot of uh, of intellectual property counsel required for what we were trying to do and and uh, our attorneys of record were here in town and had some family here and the the money markets here for us though you know I think the Atlanta Angels were uh, historically and are pretty conservative fiscally and they were kind of I would say last of the party and first to leave back in 2000 um, and you know a re- not necessarily a reflection of of the sound uh, a sound investment in thought bank but just that was just our experience in looking at the market overall i think that i think the times have changed in that um, smart money and smart people find each other and i don't it it's really it's generally hard to put a specific label on atlanta i find the overall investment or excuse me the overall environment of atlanta for startups to be to be very good, if not excellent, um, and a lot of that has to do with that kind of mashup of 
uh, access to technology. You know, we've got some great universities uh, here. Georgia Tech, of course, produces a whole lot of very, very smart, capable folks. Um, you know, there's, there is solid business here with lots of Fortune 500, 100 headquarters and more moving in to the state uh, and to the Atlanta area every year. Um, you know, it's a, it's a fast-growing city with a lot of new blood and new ideas coming in. And so from my limited perspective in, in, uh, in going out to the money markets here from a startup standpoint, uh, I think Atlanta is a great place to be. And that, you know, if you have a fabulous idea, there's certainly a lot to be said for proximity uh, in certain team building exercises and product creation and that sort of thing. But I, in, from my perspective and my reading and the conversations I've had with folks, uh, I think Atlanta has a very strong showing. So, And, of course, in, in your particular vertical, when you're talking about the ad agency business, and especially, I guess, with the idea of talent soup, it's pretty much a virtual environment, right? So it, 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 it actually is, is yeah. taking what would have been sort of a land-based or reality-type process and now is accelerating that by putting it over the Internet. So I, where I'm headed with that is that really location probably doesn't matter. I mean, except certainly, as you're pointing out, good talent, you know, high uh, – access to things like education uh, and uh, research laboratories and universities and those kind sure. of things. But but as far as being, say, embedded in the ad agency meccas, you got to be thinking L.A., New York, you know, other locations. I sure, sure. Yeah, Atlanta would certainly be a secondary city, uh, on, you know, in that, in that environment. Um, surprisingly, the more and more creatives, uh, and just in our experience, more and more creatives in our specific vertical in the advertising space are really living everywhere uh, because we are advertising and, and mm -hmm. digital digital imagery creation either still uh, either still or, or video is I mean it is virtual for all intent and purposes and you know you can have your post production done in Russia or Argentina you can um, you know have your product shot in China you I mean it's it's astonishing how uh, how well connected this this business has become, and as we see we see more and more uh, of the traditional print channels like newspapers and magazines um, either fail or go through a pretty pretty challenging and arduous growth process in adapting to these new technologies. For us, it really is for Talent Soup. It is about um, about pushing the tools down to. The supply and demand of the equation. So, you know, when we talent soup is the word talent for us is defined by professional models and actors and real people. So it's a spectrum of of experience and it's a spectrum of people and looks, um, age ranges, height, weight. You know, we're uh, we have we cross a very wide range of of looks, and because of that, they're everywhere. And uh, and the beauty of technology as it becomes more ubiquitous is. Um, we're growing like crazy. So, well, what's the next step? You know, as far as talent soup is concerned, as it relates to um, you know things like startup capital funding, is, sure. or do you see it uh, sure. um, self-financing itself by its growth? I, I, there's there's absolutely a ceiling to that, to self-financing, um, to growing out of cash flow, mm -hmm. um, and we're evaluating that right now. Actually, one of the extraordinary benefits of going through the tag business competition process was uh, they connected me with Jamie Barden, who uh, is a voluntary mentor through the TAG program. And, you know, Jamie's really given me a, 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 a great perspective and provided a lot of insight and very, very wise counsel on kind of when it, when is it appropriate to start looking outside and what, you know, what kind of dollars are we going to be looking for, et cetera. And I, I would be, uh, I would be uh, stepping into kind of the kind of the, a gray area if I were to announce really what those next steps were. From sure. A, well, actually, you brought up it. We're, we're unfortunately we're running out of time, but sure. but uh, uh, you really brought up a whole other aspect of it, and that's the nurturing environment, not so much the competitive environment as it relates to say startup and VCs and raising sure. funding, but uh, the uh, you know things like tag and other um, players. But I would assume the Technology Association of Georgia has played a, a big role, I know, in, in your particular case with the uh, recent Georgia Research Alliance business launch competition. Yeah. But that's a whole other area, and I think that we are really focusing on that and doing a whole lot better job. Done well for years in the past, but I think more now than ever, 
uh, there are mentors like Jamie and others that are out there that are really giving back and working with startups and uh, in, in helping in ways that uh, it, you would have to spend a lot of time, money, or making a whole lot of mistakes in, in order to get that kind of knowledge. Absolutely. Yeah, let's just say I couldn't afford Jamie or the input we've gotten out of the um, out of our engagement with TAG. So, Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, we've been visiting with uh, Rad Harrell. Rad is the founder and president of Talent Soup, and that's uh, talentsoup.com. That's it. Okay, and it's a startup, and, and uh, it, actually it's uh, doing quite well, growing rapidly. was a finalist just recently. We were talking about the uh, Georgia Research Alliance business launch competition, and they were finalists in that uh, event. Uh, but, uh, Rad, best of, of luck to you, and thank you for joining us today on uh, Tech Talk. Thanks so much, Frank.